me in prayer once again, brothers and sisters, please. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity one more time to gather as a body of believers, those of us who are embracing Jesus as Savior and Lord, to huddle around your word, to listen to what the Spirit of Christ has to say through the word of Christ to the body of Christ, so that we might be challenged where we need to repent that we would, where we need to express and enjoy greater faith, that you are who you say you are, that you are doing what you say you are doing and have made us to be who you have said you have made us to be, that we will grow in that faith. We desire to be protected from the evil one. Our minds will be attacked even during these next minutes to try to distract us from hearing the Spirit of Christ. Protect the flock from your evil one. Protect the flock, myself included, even from ourselves. And let us be focused on, on you and the word that you have given to reveal yourself to us. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Before I begin preaching, uh, I have not had the time to send the email out yet, but uh, you did receive the first email informing you that our brother in Christ, Marley Del Carmen, was ushered into the presence of the Lord. And um, again, we grieve his passing, pray for Nina and the family. But we also rejoice in the Lord for a faithful servant uh, that, is, that is in the presence of his Lord where he would want to be. His greatest goal has now been realized. With that, Marley's memorial service will not take place until sometime in November. So that's why you haven't received word yet, but I'll, I'll make sure I reaffirm that through email uh, either later this evening or tomorrow. Okay? We are in 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Again, what you are hearing really is a, a, a personal testimony, maybe, and challenge through this time together. You hear the Spirit's words speaking to me, speaking to the flock. I hear Paul speaking to Timothy. I hear my grandfather speaking to me. This is a weird sense to engage this text with all of those different things going on. But it's a joy nonetheless. We've been challenged. <clears throat> Paul has told Timothy, you desire a good thing, but you need to understand, if you're going to be involved in ministry of the gospel, it is going to be a very difficult thing. Amen? We've seen that so far. It's going to be a very difficult thing. And again, if you want to be popular, be an entertainer. If you wish to be a leader, you need to get used to choppy waters. That's just the nature of leadership, and it's certainly the nature of leadership in pastoral ministry and ministry of the gospel. But to all of this, task, ministry of the gospel, all of us who are born again are called to faithfully represent, to faithfully communicate, to faithfully live out the gospel of Jesus Christ, regardless of the circumstances in which we find ourselves, regardless of whether the culture is embracing that truth or if they flat out reject that truth, if the culture increasingly rejects that truth, it makes no difference to the faithfulness of the church of Jesus Christ. The message of the gospel does not change because of what people may want or not want to hear. We don't tell parts of the gospel that are more palatable and leave out those parts that are less palatable. Jesus Christ himself is exclusive. Amen or no? 
So tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So enable us, God. That's where we are again this morning. We came out of verses 11, 12, and 13 on a high note, reminding us of some eternal truths. We're going to end today with verse 19 with some more of those. But we were told in the midst of this, you're going to endure everything. Paul has told him, I endure everything for the glory of God in chapter 1. Chapter 2, he said, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, and you need to as well. We exist for the glory of God and for the flourishing of his people. That's, that's our mission. That's why we're here. And always remember in the midst of this, if we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure in the midst of all circumstances as a good soldier to please the one who has enlisted us, we will one day reign with our Lord Christ. If we deny him, he will also deny us. But even in the midst of our being faithless, God never changes because he cannot deny himself. He cannot cease being God. He is always faithful. Every circumstance, even when we can't see it, God is faithful. Even when we can't feel it, God is faithful. Even when we don't know it, God is faithful. Now, with everything that has been discussed, this glorious gospel that those of us who are embracing Jesus that we have received, the salvation that we received in Jesus Christ, the call to take our share of the sufferings with Christ, with Paul, with Timothy, as a result of our being faithful to the gospel, the call to be faithful like a soldier who endures, like an athlete who's disciplined, like a hardworking farmer who perseveres. Verse 14. There's some things that I want you to strive to do, Timothy. And there's some things that I want you to strive to do, church. Remind them of these things. Jeremy, this goes back to our conversation on Friday. Remind them of these things. Verse 13, well, yeah. Verse 12, certainly. Verse 11, But I would venture to say it takes us all the way back to the beginning of this particular letter. Everything that the Holy Spirit has superintended my writing to this point, you remind them, you remind the church, you remind the people of all of these things. Why? Because these things are central. Is everybody in the house with me? Pastor, we spent six months just preaching the cross. And how many of you grew in your understanding of the nature, the implications, the meaning, the significance, the breadth, the depth of the cross of Jesus Christ? I could preach the cross the rest of my life and still not mind the depths of the beauty and the glory and the majesty of the work of Jesus Christ on that rugged cross. 
Why take six months on preaching the cross? We've heard it all before. And we have forgotten it just as many times. Again, this word remember and remind, this isn't, this isn't simply a fond thought looking back on. This is a call to action of the will. Remember with me the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel puts everything else in perspective. I cannot begin to address, to think through, to draw good conclusions about the serious issues in our culture today unless I am constantly grounded and centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can't do it. If I don't have a grasp of the parts in light of the whole, if I don't understand the the parts of Scripture in light of the whole of Scripture, I'm missing something. Remind them of these things. If I don't have any kind of concept of God's good intention with creation, then sin remains a mystery to me. And the fall remains a mystery to me. And if sin remains a mystery to me, the redemptive purpose of God in Jesus Christ remains a mystery to me as well. You need Jesus. Why? Jesus is the answer. What in the world are the questions? Here in First or Second Timothy, Paul has helped us as ministers of the gospel, not only with good answers and good process of thinking, he has helped us to ask better questions and to help others ask better questions. Remind them of these things. Once? No. Your entire ministry is going to be filled with reminding the people of God of these things. Now, you'll show it in different applications. You'll show it in different areas of life. But every and any series of preaching that takes place, there should be that common thread that goes through all of the teaching in the church of Jesus Christ. Amen or no? We teach on a social issue, we still come back to the gospel. Why? Because that's who we are. If we don't know our identity, we're not going to find ourselves and where we take our stand with God in the midst of this culture. Remind them of these things continuously. You're going to try to engage and address the, the conversations that go on with regard to gender, sexuality, sexual practice. Where do you think we begin that conversation? The story of God, the gospel, the whole gospel for the whole person. Remind them of these things. Well, it seems, Pastor, that regardless of what you're preaching on, there's this one drumbeat that you continually drum. If you sense that to be the case, then I will simply say, hallelujah. I think I've been faithful. Remind and remind and remind. We can become tremendously bright about a number of things. 
And we can become very philosophically astute in the way that we make arguments. But never let us think that sophistication of argument equates to godliness, because it does not. Surrendering to the glory of the one who is our Lord Christ, that's our great joy and delight. He is our great joy and delight. Remind them of these things. And charge them before God, not to quarrel about words which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened, they are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And, second inscription, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. There's really three things that I think we're supposed to grasp today that Paul wanted Timothy to grasp, that Paul had to grasp under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There's some things that we need to strive for. There's some things we need to strive to stay away from. There's some things we need to strive to hold on to. So what do we strive to do? Well, First, we already spent the time talking about the first phrase, right? Remind them of these things. Charge them before God. This is not me trying to impose my will onto you. Nothing could be further from the truth. I am simply trying to be a vessel that conveys the word of God to you without maligning it and without misrepresenting it. That's what I strive to do every Sunday. It scares the living daylights out of me. You'd think after 30 years, right, that you'd, nope. Still scares the living daylights out of me. Because I'm held accountable. And as a teacher and pastor, I'm accountable for more than myself. Remind them of these things. Don't go into your own junk. Because that's when you're going to mess stuff up. Remind them of the things that I've given to you. Charge them before God. It is God that we are being called before to say, here is what the Spirit of Christ has to say through the Word of Christ to the body of Christ, and we need to surrender to the authority of the Word of God and obey God. Charge them before God not to quarrel about words. Oh. I'm a word guy. And you know where the battle rages today in our culture? Words. So what does this mean? I debate over Words. I grow weary of good words being stolen by evil and used for evil, and then we as the church hand that language over, and we don't use it anymore. And without discussing, without 
entering our voice into the public sphere, we just let language go. You can't say this word anymore because it doesn't mean what it once meant. Is everybody with me? You have to have your head stuck way in the sand if you're not recognizing what I'm talking about here. We lose language. And the church, largely, for far too long, has remained silent. So what does this mean? Don't quarrel about words, which does no good. Well, this is in the context of false teachers. Paul is going to mention one, and he does mention one in the text that we've already read. He mentions one that at the end of 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 1, it says that person has been excommunicated, disciplined from the fellowship of the church. You know why? You know what false teachers have done? They have communicated false words. So there was a confrontation about words. What it was not was a mindless quarrel just for the sake of debating and arguing. It wasn't irrelevant, and that's the context we're talking about here. Charge the people to remember what I'm saying and don't quarrel about words that are irrelevant. You, you stay focused on the main deal. I won't, tell, I won't tell you what kind of sessions I call them, but did, have any of you, did any of you live in a college dormitory? And late at night, did you have conversations with those in your room or your unit or your hall? Could be a Thanksgiving dinner table. <laughs> or a Christmas meal when family gets together and you're heated, you're quarreling about stuff that in the end doesn't matter at all. And you waste your time. But see, wasting your time, that's a minor problem compared to what's being addressed here. As ministers of the gospel, you get caught up in an argument and debate just for the sake of winning an argument or debate about things that don't matter? You destroy the very people that you wish to teach. You can destroy the very people that you wish to edify. In fact, the word that is used in this paragraph is... I'll say it in the way we say it because it's the actual word. It is catastrophe, which is turning it upside down, the complete opposite of edification, to build up. You use your ability to build up in the faith. Does that mean that you have to argue against that which is false? Yes. Do you have to speak against that which is not true? Yes. Do you have to bring to, to light falsehood that destroys, devastates, divides a church? Yes. Because it's relevant, because it matters, and because it is directly contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't get wrapped up in the church. Don't get wrapped up in those quarrelsome arguments for the sake 
of just getting involved in quarrelsome arguments. It does harm to people. The people that you began this journey in wanting to edify, you've actually participated in tearing them down. And I'm confident that none of us actually wants to do that. Amen? It's one thing, this is still, verses 14 and 15 are those strive to do these things. The second part of this in verse 15, it is one thing to charge other people, Timothy. It is one thing to remind them of these things and charge them before God. But you need to check yourself. Do you see it? Verse 15. You need to do your best so that you are able to present yourself to God as one who is approved. You want to be that person who received a talent or two or five or ten. You want to be that person who received those talents from the Lord and you invested them, you used them for his honor and glory on his behalf so that when you come back, he says, you are approved. You did a good job. You were faithful with what I gave you. You need to keep yourself in check. Don't just go around charging other people. Don't just go around calling other people to be faithful to God before God. You yourself need the embodiment of that. If you're going to be a minister of the gospel, your life better reflect the reality of the gospel. That is absolutely true of your pastor. Not that he exhibits it that he is supposed to. You have every right to judge the character and life of your pastor to see if indeed that is true and real in his life, in the life of his family, and the way that he interacts with the Word of God and with you. Timothy, you do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who has no need to be ashamed. Roger Wearsman. You exhibit the character of my father in this. So let's just chat about this for a sec. Anything that has your name attached to it, that you had your hands on in this building, It grinds you if it's not just right, doesn't it? Yeah. And Dory's going, oh, my word, Pastor, you have no idea. You think you know, but you have no idea. Yeah, why is that? Well, because your name's attached to it. And workmanship matters. When my name's attached to something, I, I want it to be excellent. For the glory of God, because I'm doing this for his glory in the first place. I don't want I don't want my name to be attached to some kind of work that I'm ashamed of. My dad crafted guns as I was growing up. Made them. I say crafted because he was a craftsman, a worksman, an artist. Beautiful guns, muskets, Kentucky long rifles. The two favorite guns that he made, he made a 308 Norma Mag. To most of you, that means nothing. To some of you, you'll recognize, you know, kind of sniper rifle that my grandfather would have used in World War II. 308 Norma Mag. Crafted a beautiful, beautiful stock. 
just a fantastic barrel with glass float. That thing shoots truer than any gun that I have ever shot that has been manufactured by a company. And I have shot most manufacturing companies that build rifles. Shoots true. You can put that puppy 800 meters out and consistently hit three inch squares. Again, to many of you, it doesn't mean a thing. To those of you who shoot, that should be a wow right about now. My dad would see the workmanship or non-workmanship of other guns makers and would silently be appalled. There was one little thing, one little thing. He would undo his work and recraft that one little thing. How much does good workmanship matter in architecture, Tom? Your whole reputation is staked on good workmanship. How about the engineers in the house? Your whole reputation is staked in workmanship. How about teachers? You know the difference between good workmanship as a teacher and those who just put in the time. Amen or no? Has anybody seen, been able to actually experience the difference between a good doctor and a bad doctor? See, we get it. You want to be, you need to do your best in your preaching, you're proclaiming the gospel, you're speaking truth to people. You need to be, you need to be, Seek to be excellent at what you are doing to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who is not ashamed of the work that they're putting forward with your life and with your lips. God's name is attached to this life. God's name is attached to these lives. God's name is attached to this life. And it matters that we do not re bring reproach upon his name. My name is attached to what I am doing. And it should matter. He puts this square context of rightly handling the word of truth. You see it at the end of verse 15? Unless there's any mistake, what he's really driving home here. You need to work. You need to be disciplined. You need to study. You need to think. You need to practice. What you do, you do on behalf. And every, every, Adult Bible Fellowship teacher, student ministries teacher, children's ministries teacher, everybody who is going to give voice from the Word of God today. You bring the goods so that you are not ashamed by what is being presented, so that you can stand before God and say, I have done my work by your grace for your glory, and here is my sacrifice of praise given to these people. That's how serious this is. Why, pastor, do you seem so serious when you preach the word of God so often? Because this is serious work. This is my sacrifice of praise. It is not by any means perfect. I am not by any means one of those great preachers that can be put up against other preachers who proclaim the Word of God much better than I. But I have used and am using everything that you've given to me, 
by your grace, for your glory, in offering this sermon as a sacrifice of praise to you for your saints. And I will not walk away from this pulpit ashamed of what has been proclaimed. That's the goal every single Sunday. That perhaps you'd know Christ just a little bit better. Perhaps you'd surrender to Christ just a little bit more. Perhaps we'd understand some things just a little bit better together. That God would be glorified. That we would be blessed and changed. Not because of me, but because we heard the word of the Lord rightly. That's it. This is what you need to strive to do. Some things that you need to strive to stay away from, Tim. Avoid irreverent babble. This is what the false teachers have done. Avoid irreverent babble. You don't need to spend all of your time tickling people's ears. Is there a place for humor in sermons? Absolutely. Are there times when humor is not warranted? Absolutely. How do you know the difference? Well, is it still moving us forward in understanding what God has for us or not? I don't need to waste your time with irreverent babble. The fact of the matter is, you don't need to waste my time with irreverent babble. And when we're making known the gospel to people, guess what we don't need to waste their time with? Irreverent babble. Because these false teachers, one commentator said, these false teachers, I like the language, are godless chatterboxes. Isn't that good language? There's godless chatterboxes. I like to chatter. And I like to be the center of attention. I've got something new and novel to say. And you know what else it is? It's provocative. Yeah, falsehood usually is. Agreed? Do you know the majority of systematic theology writings that go out today? Avoid irreverent babble. You know why? Because it's going to lead the people who proclaim it. This could go either way in the Greek. It's going to lead the people who proclaim it, and it's going to lead the hearers of those who hear this irreverent babble. It is going to lead them into more and more and more ungodliness. Why? Well, if you're consistently hearing, which we are, brothers and sisters, Monday through Saturday, when you are consistently hearing worldviews, thoughts, philosophies, directions, orientations of heart, directions of mind that are completely contrary to the Word of God, if you are not continually reminded of these things and brought back to center, you will be led astray. And the more we give ear to falsehood, the further astray we will be led. Because the more we listen to falsehood, the more likely we are to embrace some of it. 
the more likely we are to embrace some of it, the more likely we are to embrace a little bit more of it. The more likely we are to embrace a little bit more of it, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Until we're people like Hymenaeus and Philetus. I don't know if these dudes started out saying, my goal is to be a false teacher in the church of Jesus Christ. It's going to lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk, here's the medical terminology, the to- their talk and their talking, it's going to spread like gangrene. That's what happens. It spreads like gangrene in the particular person who takes on a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And it spreads like gangrene in the church. Because one person who gives ear to something that is false has great propensity to share that with someone else. I'm old enough to remember the Prell shampoo commercials. Anybody else? Well, you're, you're not going to be, so don't worry about it. It was one of those where the TV screen kept on going to a whole bunch more images. And she told two people, and they told two people, and they told two people, and they told two people, right? It spreads like gangrene. That's how falsehood works. Amen or no? Tell me that's not your experience. For some odd reason, falsehood that is new and provocative, it can spread faster than what truth does. Because truth is old. We know it. We've all heard it many times. Now, this is new. And this kind of information and thought is it's kind of fun. Don't quarrel about words of irrelevant and don't be a godless chatterbox. It spreads like gangrene in the individual person and within the body of Christ. Among them are Hymenaeus, and Philetus. Just so you can see what I was talking about, go back to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse, second half of verse 19 and verse 20. By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus, there he is, and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme, handed over to Satan. They've been excommunicated. They have been removed from the fellowship of the church. But it's not as if Hymenaeus would have, would have just ceased his teaching because he was removed. Obviously, he hasn't repented and turned and changed. He's still at it, doubling down. They've swerved from the truth. Well, what, what did somebody like Hymenaeus say? The resurrection has already happened. They're upsetting the faith of some. Well, yeah. Are you with me? Do we have hope of the resurrection when Jesus Christ returns? No, don't think of it that way. You've got to think of it as a spiritual, a spiritual experience where... We have truly died with Christ, but now we are resurrected. The resurrection has already happened. Right, but the resurrection. Yes, we've died with Christ, and we're living in Christ, but there's this confident hope and expectation that Jesus is going to return as King of kings and Lord of lords and and we will live with him forever. That he's going to restore material with immaterial. We're going to be resurrected from the grave. And we're going to be forever in redemptive fellowship with him. That is the Christian hope. 
Under the superintendence of the Holy Spirit, Paul went to great strides in 1 Corinthians 15 to make this known. Romans 8 specifies that this is the Christian hope. Now, it's a spiritual thing, and it's already happened in your life. That makes sense that they are upsetting the faith of some. You take away the resurrection from the dead and the ultimate healing in Jesus Christ. If we are only able to trust in Christ, for right now and not for all eternity, then it seems to me that we are a most miserable people. So what happens when you die? Well, you die, but you really get to live now. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't like just parts of the gospel. I want the whole gospel or nothing. And that's what's at stake here. So is Paul debated about words? Yes, that were relevant. Was he faithful and is he calling Timothy to be faithful? You need to understand I've been responsible in leading people to discipline people out of the church, Timothy, and you need to be responsible for that too. I don't like that. Neither did I. Is it difficult? It is. It's terribly difficult. But when somebody is speaking non-truth and it's dividing and doing great harm to the flock, you have to protect the flock. If you are going to be a workman who is not ashamed before God, You have to honestly engage. And Hymenaeus and Pilatus, they were, they walked away. So here's some things that you want to hold on to, verses 14 and 15. Here's there's some things you want to do. Here's some things you want to strive to stay away from, 16, 17, 18. And here's what I want you to hold on to, Timothy. Even in the midst of all of that, even in the midst of that, you you remember God's firm foundation stands. And I'm, contextually, I think that includes a lot here. God's firm foundation stands. The, The truth of the gospel, yeah, I think the centrality of the gospel. God Himself, absolutely and his character, as we'll see in the two inscriptions. But God's firm foundation in the church and his people, yes, because he's going to be using the language of foundation has to do with a a people, a household, a house. And in verse 20, he's going to go on to use that imagery again. All of these things, sure, sure, But it all comes back to the character of God. And this is what I want you to hold on to, Tim. God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal with a twofold inscription. from Numbers chapter 
16. Numbers chapter 16 is when we have the rebellion of Korah. And you don't have to look at it right now. You can look at it later. I encourage you to read even the whole chapter. Because Korah's rebellion, the, the Korah and others come up before Moses, 250 chiefs of the congregation chosen from the assembly, well-known men. They assemble themselves together against Moses and against Aaron, saying, we don't like your leadership. You have no right to take the leadership role that you are. Verse 5, Moses said to Korah and all his company in the morning, the Lord will show who is his, who is holy, and will bring him near to him. The one whom he chooses, he will bring near to him. Read the account that's there. It's remarkable. Regardless of what is being spoken, Timothy, regardless of what is being spoken, church, the Lord knows who are his. And you're not responsible to please people. You are responsible to honor the Lord. You are not going to stand before people to give account of your faithfulness to God. You're going to stand before God to give account of your faithfulness to God. You're going to stand before God to say, have you been a faithful workman whose sacrifice of praise and the workmanship of your lips and your lives, has that been honoring to God that you can present it and say, I'm glad my name is attached to this and I'm thankful that you did not allow me to dishonor your name that has been attached to this life. for your grace and mercy one more time, for teaching us, encouraging us, challenging us, forgive us when we have not embraced the things that we should embrace and do the things that we should have done, forgive us for doing those things that we ought not have done and wasting time and hurting and harming people. 